Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, joining WEF today for the WEF Wastewater Epidemiology webcast. Joining us today as a moderator is Dr. Kyle Bibi from the University of Notre Dame. As a speaker, Dr. Mariana Matos from BioBot and Dr. Amy Kirby from CDC. Dr. Kyle uh, Bibi, please. Uh, so, hello, my name is uh, Dr. Kyle Bibby. I'm an associate professor and environmental engineer at Notre Dame, and I will be moderating today's uh, session on uh, wastewater-based epidemiology for uh, COVID-19. Uh, so with that, I'd like to ask the speakers to please introduce themselves, starting with Dr. Mariana Matos from uh, BioBot. Mariana? Hello, I am Dr. Mariana Matus. I am CEO and co-founder of BioBot Analytics, and I am a microbiologist and computational biologist by training. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, Mariana. Uh, next to uh, Dr. Amy Kirby from the CDC. Amy? Thank you, Kyle. Uh, my name is Amy Kirby. I'm an environmental microbiologist in the Waterborne Disease Prevention Branch at CDC, and I'm currently deployed to the COVID-19 response as part of the Community Interventions Task Force, specifically on the water sanitation and hygiene team. Thank you. Um, so with that, uh, as moderator, I will just take a few minutes to introduce uh, this overall topic. So many of you watching uh, this uh, webinar are maybe familiar or have seen recent reports about the detection of the virus that causes COVID-19, this virus is called SARS coronavirus 2, in wastewater. And uh, you may be tuning in to, uh, because you have questions about what that means. And so what we're going to be covering today is what this information uh, tells us or has the potential to tell us and also what it uh, doesn't tell us. So starting at the beginning, uh, wastewater-based epidemiology has been used uh, for multiple decades, including for infectious diseases uh, such as polio virus. Uh, and here we have a basic overview of the process as it uh, was applied uh, to monitor for COVID-19. So infected individuals or individuals that are infected with this virus uh, may not even be aware that they carry it, uh, asymptomatic carriers, or may have mild symptoms, and therefore they wouldn't actually be tested and receive a clinical diagnosis of the infection. However, everyone that's infected with this virus, or the majority, not everyone, the majority of those that are infected with this uh, virus uh, shed it, including um, in their stool. So they excrete this virus in their stool. Um, and there's still uh, data being developed on what fraction of people excrete this uh, virus in their stool or, or the viral RNA in their stool. Uh, because they excrete this uh, viral RNA in their stool, uh, we can detect it in uh, the wastewater treatment plant uh, or in, at uh, other points in the wastewater collection system. And this may allow us to inform outbreak response, uh, such as early warning surveillance, uh, community restrictions, including lockdowns, when to start it and stop. And this is what this research uh, is all, all about. Now, it's also important to recognize what uh, these detections do and, and don't tell us. So, so just as a brief overview that the speakers will be covering in more depth, uh, there's um, limited evidence uh, that uh, the virus excreted in stool is infectious and um, the most recent reports seem to suggest that it's not. Uh, so these detections are based on a viral RNA. They're not based on infectious virus and they're, they're being monitored to look for uh, the prevalence of this uh, virus and infection in the community. And they're not being monitored to uh, look for infectious virus. So these techniques do not tell us that. Uh, so that's my brief overview of the overall process here. My contact information is below, and I'd also like to give uh, credit for this figure to a postdoc in my group, Dr. Aaron Bivens. Um, so with that, I will uh, pass it on uh, to Dr. Mariana Matos uh, from BioBot uh, for her presentation um, of, of BioBot's developments in this area. Thank you, Kyle. So at BioBot, we believe that wastewater 
is a very important source of public health information. As Dr. Kyle mentioned before, it already has been successfully used to look at poliovirus outbreaks, as well as consumption of drugs. When we started the company back in 2017, we, our team met at MIT, together my, with my co-founder, Nusha Gailey, and Professor Eric Ohm. We started the company looking at opioids, since that was the number one public health priority in the country. As you can see in this plot, the number of overdose deaths has been increasing in the US over the past decades. And our company put together an opioid consumption monitoring program to collect data on drug use and treatment for opioids at the neighborhood level, updated every month. To understand trends in the consumption of these substances, across locations and over time. This information has already been deployed in pilots across several municipalities in the US. In particular, the town of Cary, which was our first pilot funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies, saw a decrease in overdoses by 40% in six months of partnering with us, really highlighting the importance of having information to design public health strategies. With the recent COVID outbreak, we decided that we needed to put together a response and use our knowledge and technology to look for the novel coronavirus in wastewater. And why look for it? Well, the virus RNA can be detected in stool of infected patients. The virus RNA can be detected in wastewater as has been reported not only by our group, but by several research groups across the world. And data can be used to get a sense of how many people are infected with COVID-19 in an area, which is a complementary piece of information to the clinical testing that we do today. If you want to read more about our methods, as well as initial findings, you can look for our preprint, which was posted in the Med Archive service online. Since successfully detecting the virus in wastewater from the Massachusetts area, our team launched a national campaign to be able to collect more information on how much of the virus we see in wastewater, and therefore what is the extent of this outbreak in different communities. Since launching this campaign in March, we have now over 150 wastewater treatment plants participating. We are testing about 10% of the US population on a weekly basis. And our team is constantly growing our internal capabilities in order to accommodate testing from more locations. Again, our motivation is to provide epidemiological information to understand when it's safe to open our cities again. Talking a bit more about our methods, we put together a sewage sampling kit that treatment plants can use to submit samples back to us. We run the lab analysis, which is uh, as Dr. Kyle explained before, uh, looking for the genetic signature of the virus through a technique called qPCR, and therefore is not able to differentiate if the virus is present in the wastewater were viable or not. And finally, we provide a customer report to help people understand approximately how many infections are happening in their community. I want to take a moment to make a note that our team is effectively destroying any remaining viruses in the wastewater through a pasteurization step. And this is to make handling in the lab uh, more innocuous. Evidence so far suggests 
that virus shed in stool is already inactive and not infectious to others. But so this is really an extra precaution that we are taking um, to further guarantee safe handling of the samples. Finally, we present those results back to the treatment facilities that participate in our program through a report. And this report highlights several pieces of information so they can begin to interpret the results. First, we share with them the confirmed COVID-19 cases in their county as reported by other sources. Second, we tell them if the SARS-CoV-2 virus was detected in their wastewater sample, and if so, at what concentration, expressed as copies of genomes of the virus per liter of wastewater. This is the result of the laboratory technique that we use to measure the concentration of the virus in wastewater. We also use our model to estimate approximately how many people in their community are infected and what percent of their catchment that represents. This yellow box is the result of our modeling, which is constantly being improved and therefore should be interpreted with caution. We're also now building uh, trending data since most of the treatment plans in our program are providing weekly samples. And finally, we're also working into building comparisons across locations. Um, so for example, comparing the numbers that we see in their plant with numbers collected in other parts of their states or in other hotspots of the country. And what we hope is that this information can complement existing epidemiological data to better understand when to reopen cities as well as an early warning system for the re-emergence of the virus uh, later this year. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mattis from uh, Biobot. Uh, so we will have some time for discussion at, at the end, but right now we'll move to Dr. Amy Kirby from CDC. So I wanted to take this time to address a question that we keep getting, which is uh, around whether or not these detections represent a health risk um, associated with wastewater. Um, and so I wanted to talk through that process and, and give some of the data on why we think this is not um, presenting a risk, uh, both to the community or to wastewater workers. So the first thing uh, to recognize is that we have not uh, got conclusive data on whether or not the virus that is shed in stool is infectious. Um, some studies have not been able to recover live virus, which would suggest that it is not infectious. Um, there have been a few small studies that have reported isolation. Um, and so right now, uh, we're still in a space where we think that is inconclusive, but unlikely um, to present a significant infection risk. And so that is the source of virus that's being shed into wastewater. And so if we don't think it's infectious in stool, um, we think it's unlikely to present a substantial infection risk when it's present in wastewater. Um, we have also looked at this from an epidemiological perspective. So are we seeing um, clusters of disease that would suggest that a wastewater exposure is a risk for COVID? Um, and where we would look for that is wastewater workers, um, the people in utility plants. Um, and we have not seen clusters there that you might expect um, if this was uh, presenting a substantial transmission risk. So right now we think that the uh, risk associated with wastewater exposure is uh, very small, um, but we are actively reviewing data as it comes in. Um, and I also wanted to uh, just touch on the difference between uh, these RNA detections and a, a culture assay. Um, because we are, as Nusha alluded to, we are detecting fairly high concentrations of this virus RNA, 
uh, in wastewater. And so it's worth thinking a little bit about why we don't think um, that represents an infection risk. And to do that, it really helps to know a little bit about envelope viruses. So the virus that causes COVID-19, um, SARS-CoV-2, is an enveloped virus. This is a generic uh, structure of, of a sort of generic enveloped virus. And so what you see um, is the, the red line on the inside of the virus structure there um, represents the genome. Uh, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, that's an RNA-based genome. And then outside, uh, sort of wrapping around that genome is what we call the capsid. Um, and so that's uh, proteins that assemble around the genome and protect it. Um, and that's actually a pretty stable structure. Um, and then outside of that, um, in the, the gray here, is a lipid envelope. And so that's made out of lipids very much like the, the outside of human cells. Um, and so it is susceptible to things like um, detergents and disinfectants. Um, and that lipid envelope is much more sim sensitive than the protein capsid inside it. Um, and the lipid envelope has proteins within it, depicted here as these orange spikes. Um, and those proteins are really integral uh, as receptors for the virus to, uh, to cause an infection. So that whole virus particle needs to be intact in order to cause infection because it has to have the proteins on the lipid coat in order to get into um, human cells. And then it needs to have the, the RNA genome intact inside the capsid in order to actually produce uh, an infection of that cell. So that's what we're looking for when we're looking for culture of live virus, those intact particles. A PCR-based detection, which is what we're using for wastewater epidemiology, is only detecting specific regions of the viral genome. So we're looking for target sequences that we know um, are only found in SARS-CoV-2. They're not picking up related coronaviruses. Um, and so it tells us that that some small portion of that virus is there. And that PCR detection of just a portion of the genome can still be positive even if the envelope is damaged, the capsid is damaged, or the RNA genome itself is damaged, but in a way that still protects that targeted sequence. So there can actually be quite substantial damage to this viral particle, and you would still get a positive PCR detection. And so that's why. Um, we don't automatically assume that a PCR detection represents infectious virus. Um, we have to take that a step further and actually specifically look for infectious virus. Um, and again, when we have done that in stool, we have um, not really been able to detect that, um, at least not on a level that would suggest this is um, a substantial transmission risk. But again, studies are ongoing to make sure um, that we really are understanding that correctly. And with that, Kyle, I will turn it back over to you uh, for further discussion. Great. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Jennifer, did you have any um, additional comments or uh, would it be time to move to discussion? Uh, no additional comments for me. I think we can, can move on into the discussion realm. Great, thank you, thank you, everyone. Um, following up on uh, Amy's comment, I heard an interesting anecdote that I think summarizes this this difference between infectious and uh, RNA detections for this type of work yesterday, and and that is that uh, what we're measuring is really akin to uh, the skeleton, and so what we're seeing is a skeleton there, and and that uh, is quite different than uh, seeing a, a live animal. Right. So maybe a different way to, to think about it. We're only measuring a, a small part of the virus that's uh, on the inside and uh, it is completely unable to differentiate between uh, the live or dead uh, virus. Um, so with that, I think we'll open it up uh, for discussion uh, for everyone and uh, maybe to start on uh, a, a positive note, uh, I'd like to ask a question for Mariana. Uh, what is your vision uh, moving past COVID-19 uh, for this type of technique and approach? Our vision is that one day wastewater-based epidemiology will be part of all of our basic wastewater infrastructure. That, that this type of technology will be used at scale in 
every city, every town, uh, not only in the US, but you know, in the world. And that we will be constantly collecting information about the health of our communities. And we will also be constantly on the lookout for new outbreaks, either because we have a new infectious disease or a new substance um, that has emerged in our communities as a new threat. And we will be able to detect those outbreaks early, early on to rapidly respond, contain them, and be able to stop them before they reach this type of epidemic status. So ideally, with this type of technology, one day we could really be very smartly deploying resources and containing outbreaks without having to resort to, to such level of stopping entire countries as we have to do right now for COVID. That's that's fantastic. That's really visionary. If, if we could imagine how that would uh, help improve uh, overall public health. One interesting um, question that I've received uh, on this this topic, and this is open for anyone to respond, is uh, what about uh, privacy concerns? And I think it's important that we we cover that here. Does does this have the potential to um, expose uh, private information uh, from individuals? Uh, maybe the the uh, we could start with Mariana on that uh, question. So, wastewater uh, as its as its source, wastewater is already a mixture of information from many people. So, in many ways, the wastewater data is actually safer than having to collect information from hospitals or medical records and then having to anonymize, having to aggregate at a higher geographical level, um, which is what we do today. So in many ways, wastewater gives you an opportunity to collect an average of a population without really understanding what's happening on a person-to-person -person level. However, I think it's important to understand that it all depends when, where you get your wastewater, right? At this point, most research is being done either at treatment plants or from more like city level, neighborhood level resolution. At that point, you're still preserving personal anonymity, but it may be different if you could start looking at specific houses or specific buildings. So I think that there's still a lot of room for us to think about how this technology can evolve over time and be very proactive about making sure that it can still fulfill all of, all of its potential without compromising personal privacy. Great. I think that that's a really important uh, point to understand uh, related to this type of work. And uh, Kyle, I just wanted to add to that from the CDC perspective. This is actually a discussion that we have had internally quite a bit um, when we start talking about really any kind of sewage detection. Um, and the concern for us is really around the fact that um, human genetic information is shed in stool as well. So we know that there's a lot of human cells there, which contain, of course, um, DNA. Um, so for a detection that is PCR based, when we're looking specifically for the virus, um, I agree with Nusha, it does not present um, a risk of privacy issues because you could never link that um, particular detection back to any individual person. Um, however, there is some interest in moving into different kinds of detection method, methods, specifically metagenomic sequencing, where you're sequencing all of the nucleic acids in a sample. And those, if you don't take specific steps to remove um, the human DNA from that, um, you can actually pull out um, genetic signatures of specific people. And that's where I think we need to start thinking about being very careful. Um, with wastewater epi, not necessarily an issue for um, SARS-CoV-2 because that approach is going to be much better um, with RT-PCR, 
Um, but certainly as we think about broadening this to capture other types uh, of um, infections uh, in wastewater, we need to think about um, the genetic information from the humans contributing it um, that comes along in that sewage. Great, that's a, a really valuable uh, perspective. Uh, thank you, Amy. Maybe um, continuing on uh, with Amy, uh, are you able to tell us um, any of the specific uh, topics that CDC is investigating or, or work uh, maybe even outside CDC that you're aware of uh, that's independent of this wastewater-based epidemiology, uh, but to ensure that um, uh, wastewater worker safety is uh, protected? Yeah, absolutely. So we are <clears throat> communicating with our epidemiology task force to make sure that if they detect any clusters that would be um, potential indication of a wastewater risk, for example, if they start hearing about clusters at utilities, um, to inform us so that we know about that. Um, but we're also interrogating that very specifically. So we are um, just launching a study specifically to address whether or not wastewater workers are at excess risk of COVID-19 um, relative to drinking water workers. Because the idea there is it's a very similar work exposure, um, but you know, of course we expect drinking water to not have the virus in it. We know um, that sewage at least has detectable RNA in it. Um, so wastewater workers um, are the question there and, and drinking water is our control group. Um, as I said, that project has just started, um, and so we're hoping to have data on that in the next few months. That's great. Thank you, uh, uh, Amy. And I think it's also important to reemphasize uh, uh, the point that, that you stated, too, because sometimes when people hear water, their mind e immediately jumps to drinking water, and uh, there is uh, the processes that are built in place to protect drinking water are more than sufficient completely uh, to completely protect uh, viruses from entering that system, especially uh, this novel coronavirus. So this work is completely independent of that uh, as well. Um, I, I think the maybe the best way to wrap things up is just to ask if any of the speakers have any additional uh, comments or points that uh, they would like to bring up. Uh, maybe starting uh, with Dr. Uh, Mariana Matos. Yeah, I want to thank the wastewater community for being so supportive of our research and the work. You know, thanks to them is that we are collecting now uh, another unique layer of information on the epidemic that hopefully together with all of the other innovation that is happening, looking at serological surveys, random testing, and so on. Hopefully we'll have a better picture of what's happening and how we can get ourselves out of the outbreak. So I just want to give them a shout out and also encourage um, any other treatment facilities out there that would like to participate. Uh, please feel free to reach out. Um, we, we now have more, more space in our campaign to, to work with more of you. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, Dr. Amy, uh, any closing comments or points uh, from Dr. Amy Kirby from CDC? Sure, so I just wanna start by echoing Nusha's um, recognition of the utilities out there um, and the public water systems. We have also been getting a lot of inquiries from utilities about how they can help and provide public health support. and. Um, we have known for a long time that it's a great community, and this has just reinforced that. Um, so we really appreciate um, everyone's <clears throat> desire to support this. Um, CDC is currently investigating whether uh, wastewater uh, epidemiology can help us um, with uh, understanding how we can reopen our communities, so potentially integrating it as another indicator of um, community transmission status as we start think of thinking about how we can um, reopen uh, some of our communities and and hopefully keep <clears throat> keep uh, community transmission under control as we do. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, we should have more information on that in the next few weeks. Great. Um, thank you, Amy from uh, CDC. 
So if nobody has uh, any uh, closing comments, I would just like to say uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate. Um, this is a rapidly moving research area, uh, and I think it's very exciting uh, both for researchers and uh, the field wastewater uh, science field at large. And uh, thank you to the Water Environment uh, Federation for uh, hosting this Im important uh, meeting and uh, topic and uh, looking forward to seeing developments moving forward. So with that, I'll, uh, to wrap it up, I'll pass it to Claudio. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you. It was a, it was a great discussion, I think very helpful uh, to folks that are trying to understand what this is. Um, I will do also a plug in for the Water uh, Research Foundation for their international summit starting on Monday. Uh, with uh, uh, working sessions and uh, closing sessions on Wednesday. Make sure to join to join and listen to that. It will take, I think, uh, uh, to the next level, some of the discussions, some of the issues we're talking about here. Also, I'd like to say that WEF, in, because of our understanding of the importance of worker safety and some of these issues of being where they are, uh, WEF has stood up a blue ribbon uh, panel of which um, the, uh, folks in this call are part of. And uh, we look forward to, to what that group will recommend in terms of further um, uh, recommendations in, in terms of what to do next. So, and also knowledge gaps. We think that that will also be helpful. Thank you so much for all for listening to, to this and we'll be uh, bringing back more information as things evolve uh, with this crisis. Thank you so much and have a good day.